up we have John Nicholson. Now, you please know this isn't someone I met through the internet. <laughs> it was an introduction, actually, <laughs> through a mutual friend. Um, so John and I both know Zoe Harcum um, quite well. When I was chatting to her about this event, she had said to me that um, John was someone that we had to get along. And um, for those of you that haven't read his book, The Meat Fix, I would highly recommend it. And he has just said to me that he has some copies that he will give away to the first <laughs> 10 people. So please don't all charge him at once. Um, at the end of the day, if you would like a copy of his book, he has some for free to give away to you guys. Um, so I'm not going to do much of an introduction. I will let John take it away. So please, everyone, welcome John. Um, <coughs> Thank you. Um, well, uh, we've been listening to fantastic people uh, talk, uh, lots of technical and uh, kind of medical kind of talk all uh, day. And that's fantastic, but I don't do any of that. Uh, of course, I know nothing about that side of things. I am a writer, and I write um, the Nick Crimer, uh, Nick Geimer crime novels, and I also write about football, and I also write about food. Uh, basically, I just write for money. And um, uh, so I don't have any training, um, except that I do, in the sense that I'm alive, and uh, something remarkable happened to me. Now. Uh, just to give you a sort of background of my situation and health, um, for 26 years I was a vegetarian. Uh, for most of that time I was a vegan. Uh, and this is from 1984 to 2010. And um, in 1984, being a vegan was kind of very, very weird and not the uh, rather snooty middle class choice it's become today. Um, it was uh, basically I was a hippie and I believed in brown rice. A brown rice existence, essentially. And uh, this meant hanging out in health food shops and buying god awful stuff like carob. And uh, just generally trying to be kind of spiritually superior for not eating products of slaughter. And uh, this hardened into a, a kind of 26 year long lifestyle. Um, and it became who I was, because I sat when I was 23. And uh, it became how everybody knew me. And um, it was something which was not just a lifestyle, it was very, very close to my heart. And uh, better than that, um, it, as that period went along, particularly from the late 80s onwards, it became endorsed by the medical profession as a healthy lifestyle. In fact, I would turn up at doctors when I was ill later on, and they would just absolutely think I was the best thing ever because I ate brown rice, and I ate lentils, and I believed in low fat. And I believed in eating, as I did at the time, 12 to 15 portions of vegetables and fruit a day. I was just a walking example of what you should be in terms of diet and, uh, and um, in that sense, um, was kind of like a holy man for the medical profession. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they used to send me to nutritionists, and I knew more about nutrition than nutritionists did, because I was vegan, and because I'd done my homework, and I knew my B12 from my B6. And, um, and I thought I was a right smart ass, basically. <laughs> but of course, unfortunately, uh, for these kind of delusions of grandeur, um, I was actually really ill. And I got progressively more and more ill from about the early 90s onwards. And I particularly, uh, uh, what afflicted me was IBS, Irritable Bowel Syndrome. Now, a lot of you know what IBS is. It's one of those kind of weird catch-all terms uh, which describes many, many different conditions. My condition essentially could be described thus. What went in here came out here very fast. Um, so fast, in fact, it would only be semi-digested. And I used to, uh, when I ate, I would bloat out massively. I would have what I used to call my shelf. Uh, which was just basically, you could rest a glass on it, my stomach would just distend and um, I, would, I would feel heavy and I would feel exhausted and I had all manner of other conditions that went with this. But for 17 years this IBS got more and more chronic to the point in 2010, um, I should say at this point actually that my partner Dawn, who I've been with this whole time, since we were 18 and we met in 1980 and we'd shared this whole food journey together. She was also chronically ill. Now you'd think we might have learned a lesson <laughs> and thought, it's the food. <laughs> Did we hell us like? We didn't think that. We didn't want to think that. This is lesson one. Do not get absorbed into dogmas. Do not start trying to win battles that nobody's trying to fight with you. 
because I wanted to be right. I wanted being a vegan, being a vegetarian, being a sensitive kind of dude who was like in tune man with the earth and that, yeah. I wanted that to be real and, uh, and I wanted to win. And uh, I wasn't winning, I was losing, but I didn't want to let go of it. I really didn't want to not be a vegetarian. I wanted to be the one who was right, and increasingly the medical professional told me I was right. It told me that I was doing the right thing to my body, despite the fact that my body was shredding itself from the inside out, despite the fact I could have virtually destroyed the whole sewage system of Edinburgh at the time, with the vast amounts of bitter, heinous slurry that would come out of me. So, we got to 2010, and Dawn was at this time suffering from depression and from a thyroid which had been destroyed by the consumption of delicious soya. Now, soya is sold to us all now as a really rather smart, middle-class, healthy lifestyle choice for girls called Emily. But it's not. It's an evil thing, is soya. Especially extruded soya, so what we used to call soya meat which is basically an incredibly uh, industrialised product that's made, and under copyright, textured soy protein is copyrighted to an enormous food company up in um, uh, Michigan, I think it is. And uh, soya was bad enough for me, but it was particularly bad for Dawn because it absolutely buggered her thyroid, um, uh, which it's well known to do, it does it to pigs, so why wouldn't it do it to humans? And, um, we were uh, like uh, realised that we'd been experimented on really by the healthy eating industry, and uh, we'd failed the failed the test. And Don said to me one day, "It's not just what we're eating that's wrong. It's what we're not eating. And what we're not eating is animal protein. What we're not eating is animal fat." And she said, "I'm going to start eating meat," and I was really upset because. As I say, being a vegetarian was who I was. That was my self-identity. But I was exhausted. Was absolutely, I can't tell you how exhausted I was. Not just because it was a long way from the living room to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, right, we'll do it. And I thought, you know what I thought? Because I still didn't want to let go. I thought, I'll cheat. I'll, I'll eat meat for a bit, I'll go back to being a veggie. Nobody will know. And I won't, and like I won't have lost face. So I said to Dan, "All right, let's do it." So uh, we went up to Whitme or Organic Farm, and we bought meat. I said we bought meat. There was I didn't know I didn't literally knew nothing about meat because I'd learned to cook as a vegetarian. So literally, all meat was the same to me. Basically, it was red, and it kind of looked like gelatinous. And it were in a cabinet. I thought, well, I'll just have some of that one and that one. Anyway, I, what I remembered was that I loved liver as a kid, and I thought, if I'm going to eat meat. If I'm going to have products of slaughter, I want to make sure it doesn't look like soil. And if there's one thing that doesn't look like soil, it is liver. <laughs> liver is undoubtedly comes from an animal. It's bleeding all over the place. It smells like an animal. It's dead, but it's recently been in an animal. So I thought, let's have that. Let's have some liver. That'll test how squeamish I am about this. So, fr fried it up. Uh, it overcooked it, so it like rubber. Uh, obviously, as you would expect, I'm used to cooking chickpeas. I was a damn hand with chickpeas if you need anything to do with the chickpeas, chickpeas, ask me. Um, and so, uh, we ate it. Uh, it was alright. Uh, I thought, well, uh, let's do it. We, had, we also bought some steak. And I thought, right, well, let's have the steak as well. And that was a strange experience. Now, I must say, when I tell you what happened to me when I ate the steak, that you have to bear in mind that I was a hippie which means that I had undergone the quarter of transcendental hippie experiences, which basically involves taking hallucinogenic drugs. And um, uh, so I had some sort of sense of altered states. Now, when I ate steak for the first time in my life, as it turned out, except for two other occasions, uh, when I was 15 in a Burnie Inn, which I'm sure many of you of a certain age will remember, was a very glamorous location uh, for the lower middle class to pretend they were at a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'd had a steak twice in Burnley Inns, and so it was just only the first time I'd ever had steak. I cooked it, it was a sirloin steak, I cooked it medium rare, and I bit into it. And it was like as profound as taking uh, magic mushrooms, if not more so, in that I suddenly, my body said to me, this is what you need. This is what I need to survive. It was a visceral and profound experience, and one which 
I wasn't prepared for at all. I thought it's just food, it's meat, okay, there's a moral issue, etc, etc. But I didn't think anything would happen to me like this. And I sat there eating it, and I devoured it. And Dawn later said that I was hunched over it, and in her words, like a caveman with his prey. <laughs> And uh, I, 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 I kind of thought, well, after this, after I've eaten this, I mean, there's a long chapter in the book that I wrote about this. I mean, it was really quite primal. There's some rude bits in the book. By the way, if you get the book, there are swear words in, as you might expect, and there's bits of things about rude things about me, which I won't go into at the moment, but which are important to the male physique. And um, <laughs> all of which were vastly improved by being a carnivore and not being a vegetarian. <laughs> So, uh, I, I emerged from it. Anyway, I thought, well, that was delicious, and I felt really high, almost high, like buzzing from it. I felt really fantastic. Now, that morning, I'd had my usual IBS incidents. Uh, incidents is clearly a euphemism. And uh, so the next day, um, oh, we had some more meat, we had some lamb for stew. And I, uh, that night, I said to Dawn, I haven't had any IBS incidents today. Next day, none. Next day, none. Next day, none. Never came back, ever. I've been struck with it for 17 years. 17 years, I had every single meal, and I mean every single meal, I had this kind of fear and loathing of putting food in my mouth because I knew it would go out, and then it would go out, and I would just feel terrible for ages. And that also that I would have to negotiate my social life to uh, basically around clean toilets. And, um, you know, it's kind of, I used to make a joke out of it, because what the hell else can you do? But it's basically a, a curse on your life. And eating meat had lifted the curse, which is why I called it the meat fix. And uh, I said uh, to Dawn, after we'd gone through this, I said, I don't think this is coming back. This, and it was such a profound change. I mean, you can imagine. I mean, just saying the words that, you know, it, I, was, I, I felt healthy and well, that's just, they're very easy to say. But it's on a profound level when you suddenly you are not cursed by all the things I was cursed with. I mean, aside from the IBS, I had lots of pains in my joints. I had constant headaches, constant acid reflux. I, I was sleepy. I felt asleep in the afternoons. I was nearly 15 stone. I'm 11, 10 now. I was nearly 15 stone. I had a head the size of a melon. Uh, it was just like I was this little face painted this big fat head. And this was all, uh, like, created. My body had done this to me on the uh, healthy eating diet, which was basically the diet which is recommended still to this day, as Sam said about the uh, um, eat well plate. And this had virtually destroyed me. Um, and I thought, this is wrong. I mean, my first instinct was, yay, I win, I win, I've got healthy. Second feeling was, you bastards, who the fuck has been telling me to eat like this? Because you killed my bloody health. Firstly, then I, then I got even more annoyed because one, the answer was me. I'd been telling myself to do it because I was a stupid vegetarian. But secondly, I thought, you know what? Like, everyone's out there getting the same information. And we're all feeling bad and all feeling guilty about it because we go, oh God, I've had some fat. Oh God, I've had some fat. What am I going to do? Oh, I've had chocolate on the door. And we're all so messed up about food. And this is as a, pro as a consequence of basically this um, unhealthy, healthy diet. So I, uh, I wrote the meat fix to both document my experience, try and exercise it from my soul, but also because I started to do all the reading, which everybody else has talked about, um, and uh, is all incredibly enlightening and, uh, and instructive. And I went along to the doctors. Now, I must say at this point that clearly there must be some good doctors out there. By doctors, I mean GPs. There must be. I have yet to find one, but there must be. Now, I think doctors are great if you present with something that's, like, hanging off, or it's gone big and purple, and they think, oh, like, they're really good at curing those things. But when it's in here, it's in here, they don't know, man. They don't know. You know, they don't know anything about nutrition. How do I know this? Well, because when I was in the, um, in the throes of IBS, um, I was diagnosed um, with uh, very high cholesterol, which is uh, quite an achievement, because my cholesterol was 9.2, uh, which was the highest in North Yorkshire where I was living at the time. The guy who took it, and it basically, he almost died of a heart attack when he saw the result, which I thought would have been particularly ironic. <laughs> and, uh, 
he said, so he put me on statins. Of course he put me on statins. This was the early 2000s. Statins were the wonder drug. They were going to cure us of everything. And uh, he said, uh, you've got a much better percentage chance of not dying in the next 10 years if you take this. It showed me a graph as though it was a fact. It wasn't a fact. And I now believe it's a lie. I believe it's a lie perpetuated by the pharmaceutical industry to rake in enormous amounts of money. Now, uh, I'll tell you how, why I think it's a lie as well, is that uh, the doctors didn't want to know after I'd had the meat fix. They didn't want to know I was right. As you might have guessed by now, I'm quite keen on telling people that I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, well, what? I wandered in and I said what I'd done. And he said, oh, don't recommend a high-fat diet. I'm, actually, I should say, basically what my diet is, is just meat, green vegetables, bit of fruit, lots of butter, lots of animal fat, cook everything in lard, cook everything in beef dripping, and that's it, pretty. <laughs> and, um, and so I told him, and he went, oh, no, you're eating all that fat. Oh, no, you know, and I, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so I said, well, all right, do a cholesterol, because by then I was quite crude about it. So do a cholesterol test on me, all right, he does. And he thought he was going to win. I knew I was going to win. Right, came, cholesterol came back 4.9, right? And I had been off statins for six years. And I said, so, how would you explain that then? Uh, he goes, oh, it's just a freak result. I didn't want to give in. And now I recognise this not wanting to give in, you know, because it's very much part of my character too. But the only difference being, the only person I hurt was myself. And he is diagnosing other people and hurting other people with these crazy notions. And, uh, and I found this really, really infuriating. So, um, I thought, because uh, I mean, obviously there's a lot more to this whole story, but I know that everybody wants to take home point from uh, when I've done all these kinds of discussions. You know, people want to, it's, it's very difficult when people tell you all the biology to hold it all in. You know, it just is, I know what that's like, because I'm just a lay person too. And I just kind of want something that distills it all that helps guide me through life. That's just why I came up with unhealthy is the new healthy. And if you ever wonder what to eat and whether you should be eating what you're eating, try and work it on this basis with a couple of caveats to it. If you've been told by the medical profession it's unhealthy, eat it. <laughs> if you've been told it's unhealthy, get it in your hole. <laughs> Because that is the way it seems to me to be. Because I was told not to eat butter. Butter is fantastic for you. I was told to have a, 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 um, a low-fat diet, despite the fact you need fat in order to absorb uh, certain vitamins and minerals. I was told to have a diet that was high in pulses. Uh, despite the fact that pulses, of course, are really hard to digest, full of phytic acid, bloat you up and turn you into an antisocial fart monster. <laughs> I was told to have uh, very little, uh, I was told to have uh, lots of whole grains. Um, I was told that, um, uh, let's think, what else was it? Um, oh yes, yeah, saturated fat, the old demon saturated fat. I was told basically that if I had saturated fat, um, it would work like this. It would um, it'd be like hot wax poured down a cold sink. And it would just basically, as soon as you pour it, it would go, <coughs> seize it up and that would be you dead. Turns out that doesn't, your body doesn't work like that. Weirdly enough, it's warm in there, it keeps everything flowing. <laughs> um, and uh, so all of these kind of misconceptions and, uh, and, and um, illogicalities and stupidities cursed me because when I first started looking into this, the internet was a new thing and I didn't have the benefit that we have now where it's not only just being able to do medical research perhaps even more importantly it's being able to do um, uh, to, to, to share anecdotal experience to say look what I went through, I went through this and other people's, I mean I, and this, I can't say this too strongly how brilliant it's been that every time I've done one of these and I've done them uh, on the radio in America and uh, in Australia and I've done them in the UK and afterwards people so many people come to me and say, that was my experience too. This was exactly, it's not just me um, that it's happened to. It's happened to so many people. And they, and they, uh, they, they were looking for ways through it and looking for ways to, um, to get healthy. And it's all been caused by this healthy diet. This healthy diet that we've been rammed down our throats, quite literally, I mean, quite literally choking to death on this healthy diet. When really, our ancestors, by whom I mean, 
my grandma's generation, and I write about this quite extensively. My grandma was a uh, mining stock in Castleford. She was about that high, and she was a right arsey get, as we say on Teesside, <laughs> which just means she was Yorkshire, really. Uh, and, and it means that she was only really happy when she was miserable. <laughs> now, um, but my gran was born at the turn of the 1900s. And she knew, by virtue of all of her experience of life with her parents and their parents and their parents, it was all passed down as folk knowledge about food. Uh, she didn't have people on the TV or people like us here doing this to her. They just knew what they knew by their life experience. And it suddenly occurred to me that my grandma, for all the facts she was an arsenic get, she knew. She knew what I should have been eating all along because she used to tell me when I was a kid. What did she say? Eat your greens. Right? That's a fairly simple one. We all had that. Eat your fat on your chop. She would always say that to me. Eat the fat. The fat's the best bit for you. Always said that. When in the mid 60s, my mother, being socially aspirational, bought margarine. Because margarine, anything, essentially, when you were working class in the 60s, anything shop bought was superior to homemade because it showed you had a bit of money. Right? So, like, um, in the 60s and 70s, buying in was always better than making it yourself. And just as it kind of is now, like now it's only the middle class that like make food and have organic this and that and the other because like they've because they, because like being basic and stripped back is a middle class thing. Now being processed food is now a working class thing. And so when mother went and got um, margarine instead of butter, my grandma wouldn't eat it. Why wouldn't she eat it? She said an old deep muck made in a factory. That was very sensible. Why are we eating muck made in a factory? Great principle to take away from this. If your food has been made on an industrial estate by somebody wearing a hairnet, don't eat it. <laughs> Not difficult to follow that one. The hairnet is always a clue. If someone in a hairnet is preparing your food, you really shouldn't be eating that. And I thought, and I look back on it, and I did some research into this. And between 1850 and 1900, um, there was a study at Nottingham University, and they found that. Uh, the working class, for the first time, between 1850 and 1900, started to get a really much better diet because they were slightly better off and there was just better supplies of food. And they looked at their diet and, should, and they uh, consumed, on average, this is uh, working class of Salford in the east end of London, they consumed nearly 4,000, 4,500 calories a day, you know, twice what we would eat, because they had incredibly physical hard lives. Um, but what they used to eat, mostly, was meat, uh, fat, particularly uh, lard, and they ate um, uh, lots of, uh, it had any sugar, because the sugar was still expensive, and they ate a lot of like, carbohydrates, particularly in, in the form of bread and uh, potatoes, to fuel their lifestyle. And um, the interesting stats on this is the working class in late Victorian England lived as long as the working class do now. When you discount dying, from bacterial infections and having a large amount of pig iron dropped on you. <laughs> Which is always an occupational hazard if you worked in a foundry in Teesside or something like that. <laughs> Strip those things away, so we're comparing like with like, and you find the working class lived to about 73 or 74, just as they do now. And why was that? Was that, was, that was like, because they had no way to intervene uh, medically when people had like a condition of some sort, the way we do now. So basically, what the conclusion of that report was, was that the working class were healthier then than they are now. And I, I thought, well, that was the generation that gave birth to my grandma. That's why she knew about food. That's why, if she was been alive today, and uh, she died in... She died at age 88. Um, so she died in the late 80s, really, just, just as the healthy eating, basic diet and carbohydrates and not fat thing was getting going. She would just think it was the most stupid, self-indulgent nonsense that she'd been fed by the doctors. She would think it was ridiculous because she knew what they needed to eat to fuel their lifestyle. And if, if she knew that her lifestyle was more sedentary, she would tell you, stop eating bread, stop eating potatoes. She said all the time, that was her whole generation, and in fact my parents' generation too, if they got a bit tubby, the, the, even the doctors would say to them, stop it, cut down on potatoes, rice, uh, not that we had rice, because rice was weird foreign look. Um, <laughs> and uh, cut down on bread. What happened to that advice? Where did all those people with that intelligence go? Why have we got dumbass people now telling us to eat more bloody whole grains and more bloody rice? 
um, just stuff out for face with carbohydrates instead of fat. We used to know how to live. We lost it for lots of other political reasons, which I'll go into in the book. But the bottom line of all of this is that um, we need to reconnect. And it's just like I did. I was that, that, I was that hippie who was like obsessed with, um, you know, kind of like being a cool guy and being like in touch with myself, and being in touch with nature, and not wanting to hurt poor animals and everything. Nobody had ever said to me, or nobody ever made the point to me, that actually, life. It's a brutal business, man. You know, like, there ain't, there ain't any animals out there stroking other animals. <laughs> it's only us that do that. <laughs> Mostly, one other animal gets to a another animal, it's like, bah, the big one, it's the little one, and that's the job done. We're just animals, man, you know? And I'll tell you another thing, they give you all these percentages about how long you will and won't live on this diet or that diet, but man, we're all brown bread in the end. We all die in the end. Um, and the only thing we have to do is to fuel ourselves to have a good time all the time. Which is, um, which is the philosophy of the uh, drummer in Spinal Tap, if you remember that. <laughs> and I like to take my uh, philosophy from uh, rock and roll movies of the early 80s. Um, and so that's all we can do. All we can do is feed ourselves so that we're happy, we're contented, we are physically able to do what we need to do, and that we can have a good time. And everything else is kind of superfluous to that. Nobody wins, we all die in the end. We all die pretty much. All of us in here will die within 10 or 15 years of each other, almost certainly. We know there is no winners in this man. We're all going one way. We're all the same thing. We're all just, we're all like pink underneath. So, like, what we have to do is just feed ourselves to have as great time as possible so that we can function and we can, we can you know, be everything that we can be. And uh, so when I wrote The Meat Fix, I wanted to say I was a complete jerk, don't be like me, but also to say there are no one-size-fits-all solutions to all these things. That's what I took away from it all. There is no one right way. Please don't come away from this thinking, oh, you know, low carb, high fat, that's how I've got to be there, and then start becoming an evangelical for it. That's where the trouble starts. Find out what works for you. I was lucky, man. I mean, Dawn wasn't so lucky because she's burned out from it, and she, there's no way back for her. There's no way back for her now. And God knows we're having another struggle over uh, the issues that that's caused. And um, uh, I was lucky, and I found a way through it. And I would just say, you know, in conclusion, really, look for your way through it all. You know, don't you know, use what I've said as inspiration and use the book and have a laugh and, and feel like a better world. The thing that made me so bitter is that better life was walking right beside me for all those years and I just would not and could not step over and accept that. I walked a line I didn't need to walk. I lived a life worse than it could have been. And I feel bitter and angry at myself for that and that's something I've got to deal with. But we just all have to try and find our way and use what inspirations we can and all these great knowledge and all these great thoughts and, and then and just suck them all in and try to, 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 to find the thing that works best for you, the combinations of, of things that work best for you. And, uh, and then if you do, you could be a nutter like me. Amazing job, thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions at all? Or are we all clean? <laughs> yeah? Where do you stand on salt? Oh, I just eat loads of it, big spoons and stuff. <laughs> uh, I, I eat sea salt. Because, uh, well, it's really salty, which seems to be the primary thing you want from salt. Uh, once you have sea salt, you go back to table salt. It's like, this isn't salty, this is sand. Um, and uh, basically, I think that, as far as I can tell, um, uh, blood pressure is only raised uh, with salt if you're already prone to have high blood pressure. I have a really low, I have like, oh, I, I test it because I'm a bit crazy, I test it under my blood pressure all the time, it's currently 114 and over 78, and it doesn't matter how much salt I eat, it still stays like that. So that's crap, isn't it, that? It's just another fucking load of bullshit. <laughs> Oh, steak. It's still red steak. And I will say, uh, I have a strange reaction. I think this is because of all those 26 years. When I eat uh, uh, um, uh, medium rare red meat and there's still some blood through it, 
I actually suffer a degree of tumescence from it, <laughs> which makes dining out in restaurants very much, a lot of fun. It actually stirs my loins, and I don't know why. I, I report this merely as a physical effect, and I'm sure it's something to do with all those years of bloody lentils and bloody... Okay, what is that? I once had for Christmas, you know what I once had? A chestnut on croot. <laughs> Chestnut in pastry. Young, bloody young, man. Eh? Yeah, so um, uh, I think it's red meat for me, man. Like, you know, it's different for. Yeah, I love everything, man. Anything that's d been alive and is now dead, man, I'm going to eat that. Yeah. Do you have your opinions on roadkill then? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, John. No problem.